Hi. <clears throat> Today, we're <clears throat> looking at a lesson I titled The New Priesthood. It comes from our lesson quarter. And we're looking at the difference between the Melchizedek priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of Christ, which we find in the book of Hebrews. So let's turn to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. We're going to read verses one to three. Here, of course, the topic of Melchizedek is addressed, who is a, an interesting figure in the scripture, and there's a lot of controversy, of course, about him. So we're going to read verses 1 to 3, chapter 7, the book of Hebrews. Well, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, <clears throat> first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So what we're given here is a description of Melchizedek, and his priesthood. Of course, as you read the book of Genesis, you will find the time in which Abraham has returned from a battle with uh, <clears throat> some enemy kings in which he has retain, re retained the uh, things that they originally took. And <clears throat> the, the, uh, the priest, Melchizedek, meets Abraham, and Abraham gives him a tenth of everything that he's captured, and uh, Melchizedek blesses Abraham and uh, <clears throat> blesses his um, <clears throat> endeavors uh, in the future. Now, we want to take a look at Melchizedek and his priesthood. Scripture teaches, the Scripture teaches Melchizedek is called priest of the Most High God. The word Most High God in Hebrew is El Yom. It means he's the highest. There's no higher than him in authority. Scripture teaches he is the one we call God the Father. And as such, God the Father, according to the Scripture, has never personally administered the earth realm. In other words, he's never personally gotten involved in related to the things of the physical creation, the things of earth, the things of the human race. Turn to Epistle of 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 12. 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 12. In order to understand Melchizedek, you have to understand the relationship between the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now this principle is repeated also in the Gospel of John, 5th chapter, Verse 37. That's for John, 5th chapter, verse 37. Here, Jesus himself speaking about the Father. It says, and the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Now, <clears throat> he's talking to, of course, Jews of Israel that have um, in their heart already rejected him, put him down, 
<clears throat> than what you think to do with them. Now we know that there's these two instances in which there are references to the Father uh, in light of um, making himself known. And the first one was, of course, at the baptism of the Jordan River. And the inference is that Jesus is speaking to this, this group who were not present at his baptism. Henceforth, he's saying, you've never heard his voice nor seen his shape. In general, no human being has ever come in contact with God the Father in an intimate relationship. According to the plan of God the Father, everything has been put in the hands of God the Son. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, 28th chapter. Matthew 28, verse 18. saying that there's possibly one person in the Old Testament that has? No. So the human race as such has not ever been in contact with God the Father. Why? Because that's part of God the Father's plan. He is so great that if we were to come in contact with him, we get wiped out. That's why God the Son as a priesthood called Melchizedek. Priesthood. Remember, the human race is under a death sentence. As we read these scriptures, we're coming to an understanding more of, uh, of this. Matthew, 28th chapter. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when you get there, we want verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So everything has been turned over to God the Son to administer. Now what we find here, turn to Colossians, first chapter, verse 16. God the Son as the mandate over the creation, God the Son is the intercessor for the human race, and as his authority to make decisions and administer the human race, he also stands as in his intercessor for the human race. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16. <clears throat> for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So, he is the ultimate authority in the physical creation. All things answer to him, all things relate to the Son. Now, he consistently talks about the authority that he's given. He has authority to forgive sin. He also has <clears throat> authority to establish life. Turn to the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, verse 18. Gospel of John, 10th chapter, verse 18. So God the Father doesn't really have any interest in uh, what the Son is really doing with the human race. Oh, but, he has great interest. <laughs> okay, but just like you know, us, uh, the right. father has a son. Mm -hmm. The son has an interest in something. And the father uh, is interested because the son is interested. No, the father is interested from before the, the beginning of time, but his master plan deals with Conditions that have to come to pass on earth of sin. And God the Father does not, will not countenance sin. 
cannot countenance sin. So he keeps away. His presence is pure. His presence is holy. If it would come in contact with sin, sin would be wiped down. Anybody that perpetrated it. But sin is necessary to bring about the Father's master plan. The Father is intensely interested. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But he has to stay in reserve because of the conditions here. Therefore, the Son becomes the intercessor, the, 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 the propitiation, the sin bearer. Yes. So those instances where we, where we hear God the Father speaking to somebody, the interaction with the human race is only in the third person there. Is that what you're saying? Basically, just... what you find is the only time that's even inferred is on a very special occasion. Jesus left everybody behind and took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. There may be three men heard a voice. And even there, the voice basically is identifying God the Father's blessing upon God the Son. But we don't know necessarily that that's God the Father. God the Father could have used an angel <coughs> to transmit his design, desire, at that particular instance, because if God speaks, bang, that's it. You know, things go out of existence. He cannot, will not, become involved in a sin state. Until the sin state is over, then God the Father becomes involved. Turn to Revelation, the 21st chapter. Mm -hmm. Verses 1 to 4. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. I'll make it 1 to 5. This takes place in an eternal state. No longer, there is no such thing as sin. There isn't even a heaven and an earth. Uh, physical, heaven and earth. All the physical creation has gone out of existence. And we see the eternal state taking place. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as the bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Neither sat upon the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these, these words are true and faithful. So God the Father does not become involved with the human creation until the eternal state. But, but so, you believe, even here, you believe that this is somebody alluding to God the Father. No, this is God the Father. That's his words, that. That's okay. his words, that's him. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Moses was interacting with the people. Who was Moses interacting with? <laughs> Read the scripture. I mean, part of it does say the angel, uh, but a lot of times it says the Lord, but it was an angel. God transfers his name to lesser beings. When you read um, Exodus 20th chapter, Moses says, um, he's talking to uh, Elohim, uh, no, he's talking to Jehovah. Jehovah says, I'm going to send an angel. My name is in him, obey his voice. He transfers his name and his authority to further his plan. So that's an angel of the Lord. Yeah. Well, this is a principle that's not taught, and you have to be very careful about who you release the information to, because, because of the limited comprehension in the body of Christ, it can very easily be misconstrued. So, views and views. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, just another thought is sure. that we have Christian 
to really honor the name of God, mm -hmm. um, which is correct, but sometimes they misinterpret the other parts of the Trinity. But the honor is correct that God, you know what I mean? Yes. As far as, yeah. Yes. But it has to be understood from a spiritual perspective. Are there a lot of traders and fakes out there also? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just turn on your TV on yeah. Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, they, they speak about it, but they're not really... Okay. <laughs> it's a uh, form and substance without any... Um, form without substance, actually. Okay. People need to understand. People need to be taught and not... And the individuals who profess themselves to be leaders, one day they're going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account. Okay. Because God definitely is not very pleased with Christian okay. leadership. Okay, why do they figure they got to stick your nose in their business when you're doing just fine? <laughs> people, want, people want authority. They want to be able to influence lives. This is what the scripture tells us. It warns us of. The uh, motive, many times, is not genuinely there to help somebody, but it's a control thing. That's what I see. Oh, wow. So we see that God the Father does not become involved with the human race until <clears throat> the eternal state. All things are put in the hands of God the Son. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. And we want verses 24 to 28 when we get there. Verse 24 picks up the time of the end of the millennium when the Son turns all authority back to the hands of the Father. Verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. We must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But when he hath put all things under his feet, <clears throat> but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. In other words, God the Father stands outside of the authority of God the Son. Everything else is put under the authority of God the Son. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. The God may be all in all. Now when does this take place? Turn over to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Remember he said he'd reign until death conquered. You see that <clears throat> Revelation 20 verse 14 and 15. <coughs> death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I know John will want us to do a lesson on it too because when you get into what death is it's not what it seems to be. Most people take death as a condition of oh, that person died. The Bible reveals death as threefold. A condition, a being, and a place. In this particular per, uh, perspective, it's talking about death as a person, a being, and that's what he is. He is an entity, a being, a powerful being in the Luciferian hierarchy, and his name is death, Thanatos. Condition that he imparts is called death. In the Hebrew, it's muth. In the place where they go is called death. 
And the scripture re uh, reveals that this place of death is huge. It's a compartment of hell <clears throat> unto itself. It's got gates. And when you enter those gates, the gates close, and that's the end. You never return. And the overseer of this place is called death. At the end of the great white throne judgment, death, the being, is cast into the lake of fire with his companion Hades, hell, who is also uh, a high being in a Luciferian hierarchy. And so when these enemies are done away with, then the Son returns power to the Father, and the Father becomes all in all. Now, going back to the Melchizedek priesthood, which is uh, basically the central focus of what we're looking at here. <clears throat> Prior to the New Covenant, the Son only was authorized to intercede between the Father and fallen mankind. And his intercession was in, infinite and consistent, never ending. It had to be to assuage the, the anger of the Father. In Hebrews 7th chapter, Verse 3. <clears throat> without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Abideth a priest continuously. So the Melchizedek priesthood was, matter of fact, it's still in operation. It was eternal, never ending. But what we find, the necessity for another eternal priesthood arose. The Levitical priesthood, if you read the book of Hebrews, tells you its limitations. <clears throat> the Levitical priesthood was never meant to be um, an everlasting priest that couldn't. It's basically, its purpose was to show man that he was a sinner and in need of uh, having his sin addressed. And so it was established uh, at the time of the Mosaic Law to enable man to have a way in which he could enjoy life without manifesting curses because consistently sinning. So the Levitical priesthood basically enabled man to have a stopgap method in which his sin could be taken care of and blessings could be imparted into his life. <clears throat> the true priesthood, of course, deals with the, the uh, work of the Lord Jesus at Calvary. <clears throat> Scripture teaches Jesus is high priest is the most superior because he is fully a man and he is able to minister continually. Hebrews 7, verse 24 to 27. The, the Melchizedek priesthood could not really be um, effectual in enabling man's sin state to be addressed. But the priesthood of Christ could. So we look at Hebrews 7, 24 to 27. <clears throat> but this man, because he continueth, ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now there is a... Um, a problem with this. People say, well, he's at the right hand of God interceding for me. Well, he only becomes an intercessor when a person enters into a habit of sin. If you're living a godly life, you don't need somebody to intercede for you. You're totally free. Turn to um, 1 John, 2nd chapter. <clears throat> Verses 1 to 2. Yeah. 
My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation, the atonement, for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now what's being said here is that a person is born again, brought into the family of God, as the Son of God, we are given a mechanism in which we can function that takes care of the sin nature. <clears throat> God looks at motive. He looks at your life. As you are as you are <clears throat> basically living for Christ, sold out to Christ, and things happen, the blood of Christ instantaneously takes care of that. If you're in a particular situation, First John talks about this, the blood of Christ is a propitiation for our sins as we walk in the Spirit. But a person who enters into a habit of sin triggers the <coughs> advocacy of Christ. Christ steps in as an intercessor because that person has put himself outside of the covenant relationship that he needs to sustain him. The covenant <clears throat> will not operate if a person is engaged in sin. He's put himself out from under the grace of God into the law of sin and death again. And so the Lord Jesus steps in as advocate to plead his cause. And we see an example of that. Turn to <clears throat> the book of Luke, 13th chapter. Gospel of Luke, 13th chapter, verses 6 to 9. As you live a committed life, the blood of Jesus automatically takes care of its sin. God instituted that system. Because from God's perspective, we live in a corrupted, carnal, human, na Adamic nature that of its own volition is sinning every single day. But God is looking at the spiritual nature also. And that overshadows. If your life is dominated by the Spirit, your life is dominated by the mechanism that takes care of sin. But if an individual veers off into a habit of sin, he puts himself outside of his covenant relationship in the blood of Christ. So Jesus' advocacy as the intercessor, intercessor steps in. A person who does that becomes unfruitful. This is a this is a this is a parable that addresses that. Luke 13, starting in verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. So the fruit tree wasn't bearing any fruit. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, I find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? He answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year, also till I shall dig it, and <clears throat> I shall dig it about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. God the Father is the one that administers the judgment to an individual. God the Son stands in his intercessor for that individual. Turn over to the Gospel of John. we closing with this 15th chapter. John 15. Verses 1 to 2. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. The father 
that does the pruning. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So, each Christian's life is on display before God the Father and God the Son to see if that life is bearing fruit. If it's bearing fruit, the Father is pleased. And what he will do is to bring about situations in which the life is pruned so it can bear more fruit. But if an individual life is fruitless, like the fruitless fig tree that Jesus cursed, set an example, then the intercessing aspect of Jesus' priesthood comes into being. He stands in as advocate for that fruitless individual, bringing things into the life to encourage that individual to become a fruit bearer, to turn back, to become committed <coughs> to Christ. As time continues on in that life, it will reach a point, <coughs> we don't know how long it will be, what it will be, but the Father determines that he's going to cut it off. Now, it could be at the very end of the life, it could be at the midpoint, that the Father is, is sovereign in that type of a situation. He makes the decision. But all we need to know is that this is a mechanism that does take place. And so for our perspective, we are to remain in a committed state. And in a committed state, you're going to be fruitful. You're going to have blessings coming into your life. You're going to be a blessing to those that are around you. It's a win-win situation. <clears throat> In this perspective, we understand that the priesthood of Christ is superior to the priesthood of Melchizedek because Melchizedek's priesthood was as the son of God. Christ's priesthood is as the son of man. And our paraclete, he is our representative, our propitiation. And in this particular capacity, the two priesthoods are eternal, never ending. And so we can relax and we can receive, and we can pray for those who are <clears throat> in that particular position where the Lord has to intercede for them, pray for them, that they will in turn be moved to get back on the path that they need to, to have the blessings and, and the restoration of God come into their life. Sharon, would you ask the Lord's blessing on his people? Father God, we just thank you that you woke us up this morning and gave us another opportunity to serve you. Yes, Lord. Father God, we just um, ask that you continue to give us revelation, knowledge, and power for service, Lord. Also, Father God, forgive us for our self-centered nature, Lord. Yes, this Lord. morning, my heart is heavy with the shootings in Ohio, the shootings in Texas, Illinois. Yes, Lord. The number is up to 50, Lord. And um, Father, forgive us for not being on our knees. I pray for the people who are connected that you will send that your believers will be the first responders to tell people about Jesus, Lord. Father God, I just ask that you bless this church, the service, Lord. Um, my heart is just all over the place. I ask that you bless the president, Lord. I ask that you bless this country, our state, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us for making our own self-centered plans instead of being led by your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for coming to church only to receive instead of to give, Lord. We give you our honor, our praise. We give you our lives, Lord. And um, Father, we just ask that you bless the service, that there will be new life in you today. We anticipate that. I also anticipate Jeff's healing. I ask that you give him sweet sleep, Lord, yes. in the name of Jesus. So I just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.